Hallelujah. How are we doing today? Excellent, right? Better now. Now that we're here, we've arrived, we're, we're in his presence. Um, I was just kind of rejoicing as uh, we were in worship, just thinking of how we are God's special possession. We are his special possession that uh, he actually looks down from heaven with great delight and great joy over our lives, over our commitment to him. Even as we struggle, the Lord is with us. And um, yeah, I just want to, as we get started, uh, just set your expectation Um, We are, I want to share a few prophetic words as we get started and then uh, jump into the message. And um, I was sensing two words uh, for this weekend. And one of the things that um, I've been picking up on and that uh, some other folks have shared with me, which has been an awesome confirmation, is that the Lord in this time is really activating the body. Um, That he is really awakening his calling his gifting in, in the church in a way that um, he has not done in a long time for some folks. And um, what, I, what I felt like the Lord was going to begin to do here uh, was begin to pour out visions and dreams for what he was going to do here in this place. That there was actually folks here that the Lord is already beginning to speak to you and give you a vision for what he's going to do here and your part to participate in it. Amen. The vo- and, and what I saw in, my, uh, in, this, in this word was that the voice of the Lord was going to begin to billow over our congregation. Um, think of Psalm 29. It talks about how the voice of the Lord is like many waters. And I just saw this like, almost like Niagara Fall, the way that the, the voice of the Lord was going to begin to pour over this church and the way that he was going to begin to open up our spiritual ears and spiritual eyes for what it is that he is going to begin To do, and I saw the Lord pouring out his voice with great clarity for prophetic direction and prophetic words for what's happening in this space as we gather. So I just want to set some of your expectations that uh, the Lord is already speaking to you, and that he's going to begin to speak to you even more clearly. And that there is going to be a space for those words to be released so that we can step into the grace of what God is doing here. I just want to set your expectations, visions and dreams for what's to come. When we look at that verse in Joel, it talks about how he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh and that sons and daughters would prophesy that we would dream dreams and have visions about what? That's what I asked the Holy Spirit. About what? And I heard the Lord say, it's about what I'm going to do. Because I don't, I don't do anything unless I first reveal it. So I just want to uh, set your expectation, but again, I see in the the weeks and the months ahead that the Lord is going to begin to increase his voice and that most of us are going to hear more than not. More of us are going to begin to hear from the Lord than not. So I just want to activate that in you. I just want to speak that over our church that we're going to begin to hear the voice of the Lord so clearly and step into that fresh grace that he is doing, the now, the thing that he's doing in the now, in the moment, because with prophetic words, there's grace for miracles, there's grace for signs and wonders. The second word I was hearing, are there any Christian content creators in here? Raise your hand. Christian content creators. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. Okay. All right. Anyone else? All right, so this is a word for Christian content creators. If you're watching online, this is for you. I saw a wave of purity and truth going across social media. Social media right now, uh, the, the internet right now, is not a place for purity for most people. It's a place of defiling. It's a place that is not safe for most men and most women. And what I saw is, a, is an army of these online uh, uh, Christians that are going to be creating content that was actually going to help bring truth, that was going to restore free speech, and actually bring a perspective that people are not getting on uh, our normal scheduled programming on TV. Um, that that was actually going to be a place where the Lord was going to bring purity again to the people. And I see that there is a great harvest online that God is preparing for salvation right now. The internet online is probably the largest mission field that we have, and it's accessible to all of us. So even as I share this word, I want you to think about like how you're using your social media. Are you actually using it in a way to make an impact and a difference 
in people's lives, or are you constantly being entertained and dulled by it? God, he's given us this thing, and while, you know, there's some out there, they, they prefer not to engage with it. If it's not a safe space for you, do not go online until the Lord has given you grace and strength to have self-control. But for those Christian content creators, I want to encourage you because a lot of times we're measuring ourselves by metrics. And what I heard the Lord say is don't pay attention to the likes. Don't pay attention to the algorithm. Be consistent. Be consistent. And in your consistency, the message is going to get to the people that the Lord wants it to reach. That is the key. Be consistent. Don't worry about the likes. Don't worry about the views. Be consistent because the Lord knows who he's going to touch through what he's imparting to you. And what I saw is that as you're being consistent, more was going to come. More was going to come. And if you're stalled out right now, it's because maybe there's some things that you've had that you haven't released and that you need to release it. So, We're just going to continue to pray into that and speak into that because I do believe that there is going to be a wave of purity and truth that the Lord is going to bring over social media and that he is raising some folks up right now to be a part of it. But there's also people who've been doing it for a while now that there's going to be a refreshing, an acceleration, and a grace in that space. Amen. So Lord, do it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, listen, it's my joy to share the living word with you today. I do not take it for granted that I get to share God's word for, or with you. And uh, my expectation is this, that God is going to confirm some things for some of us that we are pursuing in this season and also strengthen some of us in our resolve for what God is asking of you in this time. That is my expectation with this message. And I also want to prepare you because at the end of the service, I want to pray for impartation. I really believe that there's an impartation on this word and that God in this time wants to release calling, to release destiny, to release new assignments, and to, again, strengthen us in our current assignments. So we're going to pray for that at the end of the service. And I really want you to, if the Lord is stirring on the inside of you during this message, at the end of the service, don't wait for us to call you forward for prayer. I want you to come forward so we can begin to lay hands on you. And prayer team alert, that's for you too. So prayer team, be ready. We're not going to pray those long prayers. We're just going to pray impartation for the Lord to release over you your calling, your destiny, your gifts for all those things to be activated. And uh, as you know, if you haven't been with us over the past few weeks, we're in a series called Victorious Living. And the focus of this message today will be uh, gaining the victory in your calling. Someone just say, I'm called. called. Come on, say it like you mean it. I'm called. We are called by God. And when the Lord created each one of us, he had a very specific idea in mind for what our life would be. Jesus is not haphazard about anything in our life. He wants our life to make sense. And when it doesn't make sense, he wants us to have a level of trust in him that uh, we will still obey him even if we don't understand. I'll say that again. There should be a level of trust in us that when life does not make sense, we will still obey because the results come from him. We don't do things. There's no transaction between us and Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I paid my tithes. You got to bless my life. We leave the results to him, and our objective is obedience. Because obedience produces a result that we often don't see for a while, because God is patient. God's so intentional. From the spouse that he has chosen for you, just look at your wife, say, I love you. Look at your husband, say, I love you. Just tell him you love. God chose that person for you to the boundaries that you were born in. He knew where you needed to be born to the era of history that he's placed you in. God is so intentional. He has a well thought out plan that even factors in our shortcomings, our failures, our weaknesses, our mistakes. He factors all that in. There's a little clause in the will of God for those things. He says, we have an advocate with the father. Because we know when we sin, it detracts us. It moves us away from the thing that God's created us for. But he has even factored that in. And in the foreknowledge of God, he's played out every scenario of us screwing up and still getting to where he wants us to be. Woo! Jesus! Receive it! That is awesome! 
Some of us have screwed up royally, but it's never too far gone. If you are alive, you are never too far gone from the destiny that God has for you. Because in a moment, in, this, in a moment, and I say it because he's done it for me, he can change everything. The object for us is as we are being transformed from glory to glory is to have a renewed mind so that we can prove what God's perfect will is. Isn't that incredible? God doesn't want us in a mystery in our life. God's mysterious, yes, but God wants us to know. He's given us access to his mind. He said, what man knows the spirit of man except for the spirit inside of him? And who knows the mind of God except for the spirit of God? But we have the mind of Christ. We can know what God's desire is for our life and have assurance about what he wants to do no matter what it looks like. Over the past few weeks, we looked at the foundation that kind of begins that journey, which is our reception of the gospel, receiving Jesus as Lord. Amen. He is Lord. All right. We don't do what we want to do. We're doing what he asked us to do. And there's so much freedom in his lordship. We talked about gaining the victory over the enemy because of the authority that Jesus has shared with us. And we learned that when we grow in authority, that happens as we grow in intimacy, because with intimacy comes anointing. You don't get anointing any other way. You must be near to him. And once we cross that threshold of knowing Jesus and abiding in him, we are changed. And the good shepherd, Jesus, begins to guide us into the very thing that we are created for. That's the journey. That's the walk that we're on now. Now that excites me, the fact that there's a path marked out for us. You know, I was thinking about this, about this idea that we were created for certain things. I was thinking, I was talking about it last night and, you know, you think about, you know, BMWs and Audis and all those nice cars. What were they made for? Lamborghinis, they were not made to drive 20 miles an hour down the street. They were made for the Autobahn. So you can experience the handling, the fat, you know, all those things, all its capabilities, You can have it, but unless you put it on that road, you won't experience the fullness for what it was made for. That's what Jesus does in our life. He puts you in the thing that you were made for. You were created for it. And I just want to say this. Don't measure it by what you see happening with other people. Because it's different for every one of us. There's some people that are walking this stuff and they love it. And I'm like, I would never one day want to do that ever. And I'm thankful for what they have going on. One of the desires that God's been birthing in me um, in this past season is to see people walking in the space that God has created them for. I think that as we're in these last days, as we're in this time, that God wants us to not, again, be haphazard about where we're serving, about where we're investing, about what we're doing, but he wants you to be where he made you to be so that you can do everything he's created you to do. And, um, you know, I want to say this, uh, In John 14, verses 1 through 4, Jesus says, Don't let your heart be troubled. In my Father's house, there are many dwellings or many mansions. And then he encourages us that he is going to prepare a place for you. For you. A place that's not like the one for your neighbor. It's for you. God knows what needs to be there for you because it's for you. And what I love about this truth is that it's not not ultimately true. Right? Like we know when we die, we hear this verse in funerals and things like that. God's prepared a place for me. But it's true for the here and now. There is always a place that God is preparing for us as we are being prepared for it. Always. While we're here, there's always a place. Not saying that you can't get comfortable where you're at, but there's always a place that God is preparing you for. And, And what's funny is that often when you get to the place that you were believing for in one season, you realize that there's more. You're like, wait a minute, there's something else now coming. I see it. It's coming down the pike, Lord. Okay, well, I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be thankful. But I'm also going to be diligent and faithful in this season so that I can receive that next assignment. Again, I have this strong conviction that there is an optimal space that God has created each one of us to flourish in so that our gifts, talents, passion, purpose all intersect in a way that gives us ultimate fulfillment and an optimal impact for God's kingdom. Come on, grab that. I'm serious. I believe that God is that 
intentional, that there is a place that your gifts, your talents, your passion, your purpose intersect with a space that God has made you for that will give you ultimate fulfillment and optimal impact for his kingdom. Come on, say, Lord, put me there. Put me there. John Wesley says this, there are three seasons in a Christian's life. There is a time of preparation, a time of fulfillment, and a time of fading away. There is always a season of us being prepared for the thing that God has created us for. And guess what? That season, how long it is, is up to you. As God is preparing you, like, and God is patient, you could, you could take a long time, he'll still get you there. But if you're faithful, if you're obedient, he says, listen, if you're faithful with little, I'll give you more. We see this process in the lives of many figures all throughout the Bible, especially those that we actually see an extended period of their life in the Bible. We see it with Abraham, we see it with Joseph, we see it with Moses, we see it with Elisha, we see it with the disciples. And what I would say from what I've witnessed, most people get caught up, get tripped up, get discouraged in that season of preparation. God prepares us for our calling in the fires of trials and tribulations through trouble. That's how he gets you ready. That's how he sees if he can trust you with what he wants to do. It's in those seasons of testing where God reveals what's in our heart, good and bad. You'll be very aware of that. It's a time of humbling in that season of preparation so that we learn to rely on the power of God to accomplish the task because we realize we don't have the ability or the strength on our own. Be weak. Our weakness becomes evident. And I don't like it. I don't know. Nobody's saying amen either. I know you don't like it either. I don't like seeing my weakness. I don't like seeing the gap. But I want to encourage you, don't let your weakness dissuade you from your calling. Lean into God with your weakness so that you can be made strong. Often the temptation when our weakness is exposed is to draw back. Draw back. We say, okay, I met, you know, maybe this isn't it. I failed. If you didn't fail, I don't think you tried. You have to fail. You learn more through failing than getting it right. You don't know how you got it right. It just worked by the grace of God. But when you fail, it causes some introspection. It causes some reflection. It causes you to dig a little bit deeper. That's precisely what keeps us from growing. When we, and, and we start to believe lies rather than the truth. When we backslide, when we see our weakness. The intensity of the circumstantial heat that we experience is meant to create in us a trustworthiness and dependence upon God that we can gain nowhere else. I could even say for myself that some of the greatest truths that I've learned about the Lord have come through seasons of testing, through difficult times, times that I would have rather not been in. Paul says in Philippians 4 that I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of his sufferings. When you suffer, you actually have a a greater way to connect with the Lord than any other time because he suffered for us. It says we have fellowship with him when we suffer, if we invite him in. Again, these are not circumstances we would choose, but it's necessary. Someone say it's necessary. It's necessary. You're like, God, I want to grow. You know, we're singing these songs. I'm like, Holy Spirit, come, hallelujah, come. But when he shows up, there's responsibility. He doesn't fill you for you. He's inside of us for us, but he's upon us for others, for the work, for the service. So this reality of calling, it's all over the Bible. In fact, uh, this is how we describe someone when they're phenomenal in their work. When we describe the effectiveness of their work, they're like, oh, this is a calling. They're called to this. They might even describe that. What they're doing is a sense of calling. And again, that speaks to that specific way that God created us. When we discover that there is a path marked out for us, it changes everything. That there's a destiny that God created us with in his mind. And he said, this is what I'm making this person for. 
And that destiny perfectly complements your gifts, your, your creation gifts, I like to call it, your personality, who you are, and your spiritual gifts. Perfectly complements those things. Just think about it. Where, what is that? What is that for you? I believe that is a dimension of what Jesus talks about when he says abundant life. Now, I want to state this disclaimer and all those processes that John Wesley said of preparation, fulfillment, and fading away, there's challenges in each one of them. Again, the the challenge in that time of preparation to fulfillment is the risk that you're going to have to take to step into your season of fulfillment. There's a huge risk. Like when God's prepared you for something, there's going to come a time where you're going to need to make a decision. And it's going to feel very counterintuitive to what you want to do because it's not going to feel safe. It's going to seem like a better idea to just remain where you are and not actually take that step. But you need to if you want to do the thing that God made you for. In that time of fulfillment, there's still going to be giants to slay. They got into the promised land, but there was still some warfare there to take the ground even though they were in it. And that time of fading away, that's hard too, especially when we don't want to yet. John said, I got to decrease so that he might increase. There's a time of fading away. And and even though we may not be as well known in the eyes of man, we become even more known in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. Time of preparation, time of fulfillment, a time of fading away. If you're in that space right now where God's preparing you for something and you're getting ready to take that leap of faith, I feel like some of us are right on the precipice of it and we're like, I don't know, God. Trust him. Listen, when you take that risk, when you make that sacrifice, when you make that pivot into what it is that God's calling you to, it's going to lead right to your destiny and you're going to be like, man, and there's nothing you won't be willing to give up after that. There will be no cost too high for the harvest and for what Jesus is asking of you. Um, So if you will, we're going to look at this in the scriptures here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 6. You can turn there with me. Um, I'm going to be reading out of the New King James Version. And uh, here's how it reads. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Someone say, walk worthy. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all through you all, and in you all. Hallelujah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, I laugh when I read this now because I think about why Paul felt the need to write that because when you start to walk in your calling, you're going to be distinguished. You're going to see, you're going to seem very different. And as people, uh, we're, we're taught that if we're going to be safe, we've got to be like everyone else. And eh. That is the most boring place to be. If the people around you are always like you, if the people around you always think like you, being of one mind does not mean of being of the same opinion. We need to embrace our differences. We need to embrace our different gifts. We need to embrace our different styles of how we do things. We need to embrace our different ethnicities because that is the kingdom. Paul said, hey, listen, it's going to look different when all of you start doing it, but I still want you to do it together. It's going to look different, but I still want you to remember that it's about endeavoring for the unity of the faith. If 1 Timothy is the letter that Paul wrote to his young protege to know how to organize the church, Ephesians is the letter that tells us the spiritual purposes for which the church is meant to accomplish. I love what Paul says here. He says, I beseech you as a prisoner of the Lord, to walk worthy of the calling that you have been called with. And the rest of this paragraph, these six verses, gives us the attitude, the focus, and the purpose 
for which we are to walk out our calling. It's the boundary lines that we fulfill our calling in. But I want to zero in on that word calling. Again, Paul refers to himself as a prisoner of the Lord. Have you ever introduced yourself like that? Ah, I, George, the prisoner of the Lord. Like, Paul was so gripped by what Jesus had called him to do that he saw himself as a captive to it. He was so gripped by it. The call of God made him captive. And we know Christ's captivity means freedom from sin. Amen? You're either going to be a slave to Christ or a slave to sin. You'll be a slave of Christ or you'll be a slave to your emotions. And you'll be blaming everybody for how you feel. Wrong. You have control over you. You'll be a slave to Christ or you'll be a slave to your circumstances. And we know that slavery to Christ is the freest place that we could ever be. It's an upside down kingdom. It's upside down. It's a narrow path, but it leads to great freedom. Even though the broad path looks like it's bigger, but it, but it enslaves you. It actually restricts you. Paul exhorts us to walk worthy of the calling that we've been called with. And then Paul explains what it means to walk worthy all throughout the rest of this entire chapter. So just pretend you're going to do your homework. Read Ephesians 4. Read through the whole chapter because the basis of it is our calling. That is the basis, that's the foundation that everything he writes about after that springs from. And it's important to note this because um, we do not pursue our calling independent of one another. There's a lot of people out there trying to figure it out outside of, the, outside of God's will, outside of God's church. I, it's a mystery, the connection between what we do here and how it impacts how you do everything out there. But there's something that happens here in discovering our calling that you will not find outside of the context of the fellowship. It's right here. We find in this chapter, I think, specifically the blueprint that will cause our calling to emerge. For me, this is one of the most important chapters in the Bible. Now, I say that knowing all of God's word is important, but there's so much wisdom in this fourth chapter of Ephesians that that will help shape the way that we understand our calling. And calling simply means this, vocation, the work. God's created us for a work. There's a work that he's created us to do, not for him, but with him. All right, he's created us to do a work. We're not working for our salvation, but this work that God created you to do won't feel like work. You'll get paid for it. It will be profitable, but it won't feel like that. I'm telling you, there is a space where all those things intersect. You don't have to choose one over the other. Some might say, I'm this and that. Don't let anybody put you in a box. What happens is when you begin to journey with the Lord, he will direct you, associate associate you, and reveal to you the things that he wants you to to be productive in. There's things that you will be drawn to that maybe other people are not. There's, there's, these are what I call little hints from heaven about your calling. You're beginning to get associated with certain things. You're beginning to uh, be associated with different people. And, 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 this is beginning, and this is so that God can give you a sense of your, your trajectory, where you're going, what he has for you. Now, if it's bad, get out of that because that's something the enemy's trying to set you up for. If it's not good, I'm talking about the good things, the things that make your heart beat. And you're like, wow, I would, I'd love that. I love what they're talking about. Those are hints from heaven that God is giving you so that you'll begin to direct your life that way. So as we talk about victory in our calling, I want to frame it in three ways. Three calls that the Spirit will give us to answer in this life. And that first call that God says to the entire world is to reconciliation and relationship with him. That's God's first call. When Paul says walk worthy of the calling, he's saying, hey, listen, be reconciled. That's one of Paul's first messages before he gets anywhere deeper than that. He says, be reconciled to God. And then be in relationship with God. We know Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law, to set us free from the powers of darkness, the evil one. We're born again. Hallelujah. The moment you're born again, you will never forget. Never. Some of you grew up in church. And don't know the moment and praise God for that because all you know is God and that's God's preference. God would rather you grow up in the grace of God. 
then have to pull you out of some darkness, even though he does that too. He said it's for, your, for you, your children, and your children's children. That moment where the Spirit takes residence in us is something we will never forget. We're changed. New mind, new heart, new eyes, new ears, new desires, all that. But often, we have this dramatic encounter, this experience where we realize, okay, God is real, Jesus is real, Jesus is the Lord, he really did die for my sins, and we, and we kind of lose momentum. We, we start, we're changed, but then we slowly fall right back into those same old habits that we were once delivered from. Amen. Come on, maybe it's just me, I don't know. Sometimes we take ground, sometimes ground is taken back. But if you're not moving forwards in God, you're sliding backwards. I heard someone say that the Christian life is lived on an incline. God wants us to go from glory to glory, strength to strength, faith to faith. We need to keep, Paul says, I'm letting go of all those things that are going to hinder me so that I can keep going forward because every, uh, every space that God calls you to is going to demand more of you. More than you thought you had. But man, he says the spirit without measure is within you. So even though it's more than you got, God will supply what you need according to his riches and glory. He says, let it all go. And I think most of us are, are good with this idea of being reconciled to God, being connected to God. That we're no longer guilty of our sin. They've been forgiven. We have peace with God. But it's this relationship piece that we lose, that we forget, that we kind of shift from. And we get into the religion and the routine and the Christian stuff. Instead of abiding in the vine where spiritual life is produced. I can't go a day without touching his presence. We have to. It's just that's where it all comes from. That's where it makes it all make sense. You got to touch his presence. Don't just pray because you should. Don't just fast because you should. Don't just read the Bible because you should. Do it to encounter him. That's why he's given us those avenues. It's to experience him. If we want to continue to bear spiritual fruit, we have to touch his presence. And these other two callings, right? Like once you're born again and saved, you're saved. But this piece of relationship and abiding with Jesus, that you never outgrow. That we never outmature. It's something we have to do through every stage of our calling is be, you know, current with God is what I like to say. Being current with him, not living off past strength, not living, just living off past testimonies, but being current with him, present with him in the now. What's the now word? The Bible says that those who are instructed in the kingdom of God are like a household, householder with many treasures and they bring out treasures both old and new. Somebody comes to you, you can tell them testimonies of old of what God's done for you. But you can also tell them what God's doing right now. Here's what God's doing to me now. Here's what's happening now. Here's the testimonies now. The further we go with God, the deeper we must go with him. Because it's in that relationship that we learn to trust God and he's watching to see if we can be trusted. We learn to trust him and he's watching to see if we can be trusted with what he wants to do next. Our second calling, which is more general, but still very important, is to the church and to good works. All right, so you get saved, you get born again, you're on fire, then God puts you in a covenant community. We can't have God without his people. Amen? Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I love you. Even if they're your spouse, you can tell them you love them again too. It's okay. It's a fellowship of love. He puts you in a family. God calls us to fellowship with him and with one another. This is a connection we have to make, y'all. Because people out here are trying to be these like cowboy apostles and prophets and all this kind of stuff. And they have no connection to the body of Christ. And if you are a prophet, prove it. Get in the fellowship. And let people recognize those gifts on your life. And then let there be the right accountability. Because it's not enough to have heaven's uh, you know, agreement with you. God will confirm it to the people around you. Yeah. 
They're trying to pursue their calling, but independent from the relationship with the church. And Paul says, if we're going to walk worthy of our calling, how are we going to do it? We have to do it with lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing one another in love. What does that sound like? Church. You've been in church long enough. People are hard to do it. People are hard to get along with. A lot of issues in church because we're people. We have issues. But he says, here's how you do it worthily. Have patience with one another. Have gentleness with one another. Bear one another in love. And endeavor to keep the unity of the faith. God will put you in a family. Family have problems, but family, above all, love each other. It's a covenant community. It's a place where deep and abiding relationships are meant to be developed here. Do you have that here? If this is your home church, do you have those deep and abiding relationships that you can call on someone, they could speak into your life, there's accountability, real accountability. I'm not talking about the pity party of sin where we say, oh, and nobody's free. Oh, I stumbled again, I stumbled again. It's like, no, 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 no. I heard Chris Valentin say this. He said that accountability isn't that so much what we paint it as, but it's an account for your ability. When you have those kinds of friends, like uh, I think it's in Psalm 101, he says, only those who are pure will minister to me. Where are you getting your counsel from? Come on online. Where are you getting your counsel from? Who's speaking into your life? Who is it? People, you want to have people around you who see what's in you and that are going to call you to it. And say, you're greater than that. Greater is he that's in you. There's, you're better than that. Come on. You, what? Are you kidding? You could be in doubt and talk to somebody who can account for your ability. And in their mind, there's no doubt. You're like, what? Why would you even think that? You want to have those kinds of people. And, and what's cool is that when you're in the church, your gifts and your passions will begin to emerge very clearly. Your gifts are activated in the fellowship because the gifts are for the church. Now, they have a dual purpose, right? Your gift functions here, but it also has an ability for you to reach people in the world based on how God uses you. But it's primarily for the church. He says he's given these gifts for the edification of the body, that we might encourage one another. It's in this space that those gifts will emerge and and brothers and sisters around you will begin to call it out of you. And say, I could totally see that on your life and begin to pray you into it. I don't know where I'd be without my covenant brothers. The church is a training ground so that we might be raised up to take that risk, to step into that unique calling. And that's our responsibility to each other is to call each other into that. No matter what season of life we're in. To call each other into it. Now, another disclaimer here. You will discover your calling while you're already being industrious in the Lord. God does not call us off the sideline. If you're a Christian and you're saved, he already called you off the sideline. You already got called off the sideline. Now do something. Do some good works. A lot of people are like sitting around. They're just like, oh, I'm just going to wait until God tells me what to do. There's stuff to do right now. Before I knew what I was supposed to do, I just stepped in wherever the need was. I was an usher. I was a greeter. I was a, you know, parking lot attendant. I, whatever they needed. Whatever was needed, I did it until, until I realized, okay, that's not for me. Okay, that's not for me. Okay, oh, 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 I actually love this. And then as I focused there, the gifts began to, the grace began to increase on those gifts. And people called it out. People invested in that. I invested in that. But if you don't know what you're supposed to do yet, do something. God never calls us out of no, off of nothing. He always finds people already doing something, even if they're doing something not good. He, he finds them there, like Paul. He found them getting ready to do something he shouldn't be doing. God doesn't call you off the sideline. He calls you where he finds you already being faithful. It might not be where you want to be. It might not be the best place for you and for your gifts. But if you will do that work with all of your heart as unto the Lord, God will move you from that place into your best place. It says, do as unto the Lord, not unto men. What are you doing it for? People are like, I'll give my all when I get to where I want to be. Wrong. Give your all where you're at. Because then God, because God's seeing what's in your heart. And if you can't be faithful there, You will not be faithful over here. 
David was called from the field. Elisha was called from the field, working in his father's field. Isaiah was already prophesying before he had his throne room encounter. He was already prophesying. The disciples were performing ordinary work before Jesus grabbed them. He put the extra on their ordinary. Hallelujah. If you'll be faithful in your ordinary work, God will put the extra on your ordinary. He'll put the super on our natural. That's what he will do into the very thing you were created for. And I tell you, when you taste of it, it will grip everything inside of you. Everything. The purpose of your existence is that deep. And again, I'll just say this. Don't compare your call to anyone else's. You have your race to run. You are not like everyone else. You are different. And even though it might be something that other people are doing, nobody's going to do it like you do it. Nobody's going to bring what you bring because each of us uniquely reflect the Lord in a way that no one else can. So don't compare yourself. Comparison's a trap. Measuring yourself against other people is a trap. Don't do that. Just be who God made you to be and embrace your different. You're different. Embrace it. All right, God's third calling. All right, so we're going to go general to the specific now is to mission and assignment. Mission and assignment, mission and assignment. Like I said, as you're doing all those works, you're serving in the church, you're in the fellowship, things are coming out. All of a sudden, you'll, you'll understand how you're meant to fulfill the Great Commission. How God has called you to make disciples, how God has called you to reach people, what he has gifted you to contribute to the world for the advancing of the kingdom. It has to get out of here. It starts here, but it has to, it's like leaven. It has to permeate. It has to get out of where it began. And this progression... Your calling, your sense of calling will become more and more specific. Once you discover your gifts, once you discover that sense of who God's raising you up to be, the mission, the mission will be so clear. And the mission could be as simple as having a godly family. That is a mission because godly families, healthy marriages, some of the greatest warfare we could wage against the enemy. If he can destroy family, he can destroy society. If he can destroy marriage, he can destroy society. That is a godly and worthy assignment and mission, right? To disciple your kids. The Bible says they're like arrows. Again, I want to expand our thinking when it comes to mission and assignment because we might be thinking like, oh, going on a mission trip or becoming a long-term missionary. And that is good for those who are called to that. But not everybody's going to do that. It's the good works that God wants to utilize us in. Here's God's, here's God's goal. You want to hear God's goal? God has goals. God's goal is for the glory of the Lord to cover the earth like the seas. That's God's goal. Habakkuk uh, 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Numbers 14.21, but as I live, does the Lord live? Is the Lord alive? He says, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. How does he do that? He fills the temple. He fills the temple with his glory, with his Holy Spirit. And then he puts us in the world. And the knowledge and his glory is expressed in that place that he's put us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, Lord, fill your church with glory. Again, the mission of God, the glory of God, goes far beyond the walls of this building. Your calling is God's mission on your life to make disciples, to bring kingdom impact in the sphere of influence that he has placed you, because all of us have a different sphere of influence too. Just because you love the word and love God doesn't always mean you need to be a, a, a pastor, We need people like that in businesses. We need people like that uh, in hospitality. We need people like that in all of these different places. Amen. That's right. We see this with Paul, right? So we're going to talk about knowing your sphere for a minute, okay? We see Paul. uh, He had a time of preparation. He had this encounter with Jesus. Then he was in the wilderness, and then he presented himself to the apostles. And he said, hey, here's my revelation. The apostles sent him out. And then he would go into city after city. 
preach in the synagogues, and no one would get saved. Maybe one or two. But then he'd go preach in the city, and the Gentiles came running into the kingdom. Paul realized, oh, I'm, even though I'm a Pharisee, know everything I can know, I'm meant to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Our vocation, our calling is not just about what we do, it's about who we do it for. It's the people that God wants to connect you to, to reach. And then Paul bore fruit. I mean, look, at there was no ceiling. I like to say there's no ceiling on your calling. You might be in a space, right, where your gifts are being utilized, but it's not being utilized in the full capacity that they can be. There's somewhere else for you. You know when the grace has run out in a particular place. So one of the things I like out here, it's called the seven mountains of influence. I think it's a good way to help frame uh, the great commission for our time. And these seven mountains of influence are different areas of life that shape us and impact us and influence us. And uh, they are family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. These seven spheres shape us in this world. And guess what God wants to do? He wants to place us in those spaces to make a kingdom impact. I didn't say Christianize. I said make a kingdom impact because Jesus did good even if people didn't deserve it because no one deserves it. He said, I make it rain on the just and the unjust. So as you're looking at those, where is God calling you to make an impact? Is it with family? Is it in the area of religion? Education? We need teachers with godly wisdom who are going to speak. I mean, you're with those kids more than their parents. Is it entertainment? How, uh, entertainment pervades everything in our life. Advertisements, social media, all that, that's included in there. Is God raising you up for that? Is it a business? Are you meant to create industry? Are you meant to create opportunity and spaces for people to not only work, but to have meaningful work? What is it? Every earth's issue, every problem we have here, heaven has a solution for, amen? Listen, that thing that God's calling you to do, it will begin to emerge as you grow in fellowship with God in the church, the path of our destiny will begin to unfold, all right? So here's some questions I want you to consider for a minute. Where is God calling you to make an impact? Just, just wait, let's just wait for a minute. Where is God calling you to make an impact? Where is it? What is it? Don't let up until God tells you. Because remember, he wants us to know his will. He doesn't want us to be confused. Where is it? What does he want you to do? What gifts has he placed on your life to fulfill it? Your gifts are the tools of the spirit that he has given you to fulfill your call. What are you passionate about? What do you want to see transformed by the glory of God? What do you want to see? It could be big. God's not afraid of your dream. What do you want to see transformed by the glory of God? And is there a people that he has laid on your heart to reach, to impact, to invest in? If you can answer those questions, it will really help you to zero in on your calling. And that's where you want to have victory. We want to work, walk worthy of it. We'll take Paul's encouragement here. So again, as we bring this to a close, there's three calls to reconciliation and relationship, to the church and good works, and to mission and assignment. And when you're on your mission, you'll get assignment after assignment after assignment after assignment after assignment assignment until your assignment's done. And then you get to go home. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our destiny is tied to intimacy. Our victory is tied to intimacy in the Lord. Spending that time with him will clarify, crystallize things, wrestle with things in your heart until God makes it clear to you. That's what Mary did. She would hear things, she would get things, and then she would just wrestle. So listen, 
Maybe you're here today and, and some of this stuff seems a bit out there and the idea of destiny and all of that, it, you know, it, it's like, really? Really? There's more to life than just going day by day and serve? Yes. If you don't know the Lord, if you have not come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that he isn't just, you know, an idea or a philosophy or a person that had good teaching, but he is the Lord above. He is the Lord of all. I want to give you an opportunity to receive him today. All of this will make sense. All of it, all of it will come to, you'll come to understand it when you give him a try, when you try Jesus. All of us in here, most of us in here have done that. If you're here today and you'd like to give Jesus a try, you'd like to say, Lord, I want to know if this is real. I want you to just raise your hand and say, I want, I want to receive Jesus. Don't be ashamed. He wasn't ashamed of us when he died on the cross. It says, for the joy set before him, he went on the cross. It was the joy of us and being reunited with the Father and making all things right. If you'd like to receive the Lord, I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about Bible study. I'm talking about receiving Jesus into your life and being born again, getting a new spirit. If you'd like to do that, just raise your hand. We'll wait for you. Come on, the Lord's calling. He's got your number. If you'd like to receive the Lord, we'll wait for you right now. We'll wait for you right now. God is not in a rush. We're not in a rush either. We want to see you when we get to heaven. Everyone in this room, we all want to get there together. So Father, if there's anyone in here right now that needs you, And they know how, you know our hearts, God. You're knocking on the door of our hearts. You'll never break the door down. You ask us to open it up and you'll come in. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that they would just receive you, that they know their sins are forgiven, that their name is written in the book of life, that they can have assurance about their tomorrow, that they can trust you, Lord. They can trust you, Lord. We pray for the gift of salvation that free gift, that today would be the day of salvation. If you're watching online and you've not done that yet, just say, Lord, I repent of my sins. I invite you into my life. Be my Lord, be my King, and I'll serve you. Help me to serve you all the days of my life. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen.